What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, SGR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Shogren, here with my brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's up, E? My brother, so good to see you, man. Uh, it's about to rain a storm down here, so I am excited because my actually my picture is going to get better as the storm comes. Um, we were just talking off air. We're coming off of our all coaching call, and we're both sitting a little bit hungry. Um, and what's funny to me is I had gotten into this habit of eating the same breakfast every day almost. Mm. And it was very much, it was a quick, convenient breakfast, right? Like it was just like a shake and, and a bunch of other stuff. And I just went back to like eating like a whole, like an actual breakfast, like real food. Mm. And bro, I feel night and day. And it was just such a like reminder for me in terms of like the quality of the shit that we put into our bodies. And sometimes if we are like at our convenience, I have come to like eat certain things that I'm like realizing I'm like, maybe my body doesn't enjoy. Mm. And it just been overall like energy wise, my sleep got better. And it's just those little tweaks in terms of like the quality of the food and actually going more towards like a whole, um, like whole diet versus just eating a bunch of processed shit um, mm -hmm. has been, I don't know, random thought. But again, like maybe as, like, I, as I drink my smoothie. Yeah. But like, again, like it's not like I think most of my mornings just out of convenience were like 90 percent like smoothies or like not real food. Um, and I was just feeling off. And then I just went back and I'm like, OK, let's let's analyze this. Like, let's let's see what I'm doing wrong and switch in a couple of things. Overall, it's brought up my energy level for the rest of the day. Yeah, and I think that, and again, I am no nutrition or health expert by any oh, means, yeah. but I feel like everybody's everybody wants like this the the silver bullet, but I feel like everybody's body's a little bit different, right? So, like the last six months, about six months, I've been doing the intermittent fasting, and it works pretty good for me. Um, and I usually eat a light lunch, and then. I'll eat whatever the hell I want for dinner and just mm -hmm. try and get my protein in for the day. And then mm -hmm. it's just keeping it simple. And I learned that from um, Grego Gallagher. You guys can check him out on Instagram. He's got a massive following. I was in his mastermind, uh, Kino Body, for six months. And it's just so simple how how he keeps it. He's like, dude, most people don't think it, but I like I have chocolate like every night. He's like, I just, I can, I know what my calories are. I know what my macros are. I get 10,000 steps in a day and I work out three to four times a week and I save myself those 300 to 400 calories at the end of the day to eat whatever the hell I want. And he's like, I just keep it simple, man. And it just works. Yeah. So. No. And, and it makes you happier because you're not like, I'm a, I'm actually like, I realized that like, I cannot do hyper restrictive. That's not who I am. And what actually happens is if I hyper restrict anywhere, I'll swing to the opposite side of the pendulum as soon as I let myself go. And that could be for like workouts, that could be for like work, that could be for everything else. And so it's like realizing that like my goal is not that perfection or being hyper, hyper disciplined. It's like, okay, like how do I want to live my life? And like, if I cannot enjoy it, why am I doing it? Versus like, then I just make myself worse, right? Yeah. So I don't know why I felt like sharing that, but again, we're hungry, but I feel a lot better than I did a week ago. So I am super grateful uh, and grateful for my mom. Random shout out to my mom for like actually teaching me to like eat all kinds of things. I think that's a huge part of like being raised by by with some kind of culture around food. I find myself being very, very grateful to my mama to just having taught me how to cook one and then two, how to eat all kinds of stuff. So yeah. not STR related at all. Sorry, guys, but. Kind of what came well, out. There. Sometimes we got to mix it up. Yeah. Know? right. got to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Two things interesting. So. But I'm super excited for our show today because these, our guests, 
are two of the cutest, most sweet people that we know in the industry. Uh, we have seen them. I, I remember seeing them at all of our conference and retreats and literally like witnessing their growth over time while still having their family, their business. So I'm just excited to have them on and they're just generally just awesome people. Um, so I'm excited for you to introduce them and yeah, let's, let's go, man. Feeling is mutual. So today on the show, we've got Kim and Dave Menapace. Uh, they are short-term rental investors and the founders of five star co-host, a co-hosting company that specializes in managing high-end luxury vacation rentals across the country. In addition to investing in co-hosting, they are best-selling authors, uh, being featured in the hospitable host two book. And they are the host of the Hassle-Free Real Estate Podcast. They own two short-term rentals, several long-term rentals with partners, and they co-host 14 properties in New England and various other states across the country. Uh, they are... <laughs> Dave filled out the bio, so I'm trying to like wordsmith this on the fly. So <laughs> Dave is a husband and a father, and Kim is a wife and a mother and has a passion for public speaking and helping others achieve their goals through real estate. So without further ado, let's bring them up to the show. What's up, guys? How are you? Howdy. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that was that was a fun test of my brain power on the fly there to, uh, to wordsmith that because uh, Dave got the invite and then I was like, uh, Kim, you're coming, right? And so we just... We just whip that up real quick. So why don't you guys, um, I always like to start with how you guys got into this. So, you know, what was that epiphany moment or something that happened for you guys to get into real estate? And then I want to talk about, especially the last 12 months, you guys have really taken off. So let's start there. Yeah. Maybe, so may, maybe we go back about 10 years. Um, Kim is a fantastic planner and visionary and organizer and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but when we were in our mid to late twenties, we did a lot of masterminding together, not knowing that that's what it was called or what we were doing. But one of the things that was important to us, or we liked to envision was how we were going to retire by 40. And we would just organize our thoughts around that. We went take massive action or anything. We just think about it and talk about it. And we, we have, and we did and still have a whiteboard in our bedroom and this is where we would talk about stuff. And, um, the theme that kept coming up was real estate. So I think that the, like, that was going to be our vehicle. That was going to be what we hung our hat on. Um, and so that's how it got into our mind of, you know, we need to really start leaning into this industry. But Kim, maybe I'll let you talk about our first property. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I definitely agree with Dave. I think that planning far out so that you know where you're aiming is a big theme that we've been trying to execute on. And um, growing up, I had a friend whose parents bought a house 20, 30 years ago up on the, um, the a beach in Maine. And they took one week every summer and then rented it the rest and it covered its expenses. And I realized that a very smart decision that might be a stretch at the time, if you execute at the right time, can pay dividends later. So you get that one week vacation and then you get a retirement home that's fully paid off and you've been able to maintain it using other people's money because they're paying you for their vacation and they're paying off your asset for you. So I knew that we wanted to do that because we were going to Cape Cod a lot. We were crashing on futons, floors, and sleeping bags. And we were you know, coming into our 30s and becoming parents. And I said, okay, that's not going to work anymore. So we'd actually rented a house and then surprisingly found this adorable little cottage on Cape Cod that was within a price range we could afford. And this was five years earlier than we expected. So we pulled the trigger you know, a few years ago and bought that 500 square foot cottage. And now it's grown into a, a property management business and another house in Maine. And so that's really what was my you know, inspiration was observing people 30 years ahead of us doing something really smart like that. And it was a stretch at the time, but now we look at it as a no brainer because it's opened a lot of doors. Yeah. What, what ended up happening was it was after we bought that house, you know, some of the things, some of the light bulbs or some of the, the switches that turned on when we purchased that home is that it said in the listing that was used as a short-term rental 
And we were lucky in that the prior owners kind of helped us set up the Airbnb account and the VRBO account just sort of let us learn a little bit. And after we bought that home, very quickly after, we both read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and really started to dive into a lot of the things that Bigger Pockets teaches and a lot of that stuff. And we started really, really leaning into this industry after we bought that house, especially after that summer of 2019 where we rented it out and we had a blast and we did everything wrong, just like everyone else does. Right. Like both of us messaging guests at the same time. Um just kind of fumbling through it, but we made a substantial amount more than the prior owners without changing anything. And so from there, we started looking at mountain properties. Actually, later that year, we started looking at mountain properties, not too seriously, but we firmly believed that if we found the right deal, we'd figure out the money piece. Um, we didn't end up buying anything that year in 2019. And then 2020 uh, kind of like came and went, you know, COVID did its thing. And I think it was that summer of 2020 or the year after, I can't remember, we started learning a lot more about leverage and we started learning about how our homes, both our primary and our Cape house were going up in value. And that's really when we decided to start thinking about different investment strategies. And I'll kind of speed not speed, but I'll go through this kind of quickly so we can kind of get a little bit more to current. But we ended up taking out home equity lines of credit and using that money to actually do, we did five burrs down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, right? And that's a whole different skill set, right? That learning how to build a team, manage a team, buy these homes, use partnerships, understand creative financing, um, underwriting these deals, these were like critical skills, right? And part of the reason we decided to choose that market, which is a totally different topic to go into another day, is in Massachusetts, with the, with the money we had to play with, which was about 100 grand, we didn't, if we screwed it up, we only had one shot up here because the, the cost of homes. Down there, we could take some reps, right? We could really start to build these different skills. So we did that. Uh, it was hard, right? You know, like we have a kid at that and then eventually a second kid, right? It's funny how that works. Um, <laughs> and, but it was really interesting. We were really, really learning how to create team members, create systems, if you will, with checks and balances. And um, so we did that. It has continued to work out pretty well. Some of those homes we still own, some we've sold off. Um, but we re like our passion was in short term rentals. It really was. And we knew that at the end of the day, that was really the, the niche within this industry we wanted to be in. So we sent an email to owners of a house that we wanted to buy in 2019, but couldn't make it work. They ended up buying it. And long story short, they wanted to sell their home. They were okay with selling their home to us. And I was like, holy crap cold email actually worked like who, who would have thought um that was the house up in maine up in the uh, newry and bethel markets and that was really sort of what um put this thing into overdrive as is now you know we're co-hosting and we're doing a whole bunch of stuff in short-term rentals but making that pivot back into short-term rentals a few years ago building on the systems we learned before going to these conferences and learning more skills and more tools and applying that has really what's sort of set the foundation for the businesses that we're building and operating now i, I gotta ask what made you decide to get into essentially like burning houses in tennessee because that's like complete <laughs> opposite of what you got so what was the trigger for that like what was the thought process yeah um there were a couple of things, you know, really we want to burn another house in the Cape Cod, in the Cape Cod market, but there's not a whole lot of houses that are like run down right on the beach, it, it, at least within our price point. I was going to say not for the money that we're talking about, <laughs> yeah. not for 300 grand. So, um, uh, a light bulb had gone off and Kim and I were in the car talking about real estate and I said, you know, at this point, it's not like Amazon stock was like 
three grand a share or whatever. I was like, if we were to start investing in the stock market right now, we probably wouldn't go after Amazon. We'd go after something that's more affordable. Maybe we should consider another market that our money could go a little further in. And that was really why we decided to do that. Why that strategy? Um, I think at least I had the itch to try to buy more real estate. Mm. And what was unique, and I'll let Kim share her perspective, is that it wasn't necessarily Kim's passion, and that was okay. Kim was still really supportive of the move. We just had to restructure how we were going to operate and take these houses down. So, Yeah, I think that's part of the trial and error when you fixate on real estate. There's so many different flavors of it. You hear people get into wholesaling, furring, long-term rentals, short-term rentals. So I think that was part of the journey of exploration for us. And I think you had been doing a lot of uh, re reading books about this. You were networking with people in various markets out of state where it's more affordable to burr a long-term rental. So that was part of the just the trial and error and, and learning process within this space. I think that we would go to those local RIA networking events and just felt out of place. We didn't feel like they were our people. And I think that it wasn't until I went to the Miami short-term rental wealth retreat where I finally felt like I, we had found our tribe and that made us help, helped expedite us really hitting the gas pedal in short-term rentals. And I think you probably felt that in June when you went to the first STR WealthCon. I just yeah. wasn't there. I was actually back here dealing with issues at both of our houses. <laughs> so uh, it was a very, very uh, interesting di dichotomy there with Dave, you know, living it up, me getting to meet all you great folks. And I was sprinting around to our houses over four days cleaning because cleaner ghosted us and launching our um, our house in Maine because we weren't ready to launch and David accepted a booking too early. So it was pretty funny having having that dichotomy there. <laughs> yeah. No, so and I love you guys also sharing. Sorry. Go, Mike. Yes. As, as, as wives always do, right? Like this is kind of like, at least it's true in my life, right? Um, and I love, I would love for you guys to kind of talk about one, I love the journey, uh, and I think that the going to Tennessee makes sense for where the whole like uh, bear movement was going back in those twenty twenty days. Like that's that was all bigger pockets that I talked about. The same way now people talk about vacation rentals, right? And the thing with real estate in general to me is once you stay in it long enough, it's gonna become a trend. It's almost like things that like you should never throw out a pair of pants because eventually if you wait long enough, they'll come back into fashion. Right. And so it's the same thing with real estate. Like over time, like people talk about wholesaling, people talk about burrs, people talk about like multifamily syndications, hospitality, and then they kind of restart over. Right. What is, what was the roles and responsibility at the beginning and what are the roles and responsibility now? Cause I think we have a lot of listeners that are in this husband and wife, um, kind of team. And we all have different roles. So what does this team look like? Who does what? Um, and when you have a decision that comes to like a face-to-face, -face, do you do a coin flip? Do you like, does Dave sleep on the couch? Like how does, <laughs> how does this, how does this happen? Like we're, we're like, who makes the decision? How does that happen? And I walk us through that. Yeah. Let me take it. Yeah, why don't you take the lead? Yeah, I think these have shifted a lot in four years, honestly. So at first, I think that we were stumbling over each other, and then it fell into a groove with me really leading on guest communication and the cleaner schedules. And I think that if there were you were dealing with more the landscapers or odds and end jobs and doing it ourselves, honestly, now we are trying. We're not doing that as much anymore. We have runners and and um, and handymen that are more accessible to us, but. I think that when I fast forward to today, I think it's totally 180 and we've grown our team as well. So now we have two assistants and I, we do still get into these um, these challenges where we are kind of stuck and in a standstill of, of perspectives, opinion. Should we go into this market or not? Is this, the, is this a, the right property we should really be leaning into? And we found that uh, actually reaching out and talking to other folks, including our coach within our mastermind, is it has been helpful in getting a different perspective and being able to really figure out um, different angles that we hadn't seen from ourselves because we've already talked, uh, you know, among ourselves and really communicated what our, our con pros, cons are, what our concerns are from each of our perspectives. But I think that we've grown up a lot where I've had, I'm still at my, my W-2 job. So 
I, Hajave is fully leading the charge day in and day out all day long, talking to prospective new owners that are, of amazing properties we'd love to manage and leading our team. So it really has to be of a certain caliber of, of a problem or challenge that we're dealing with that we converse and say, hey, there's a sticky situation here. You know, what do you think we should do here? And then I'll weigh in. Um, and so anything that's less time sensitive, like um, or strategy, bookkeeping, um, our, our, our system that works on weekends where I can work with them and have more time available is what I will deal with. Um, and Dave's really running the day-to-day -day operations. And his strong suit is definitely sales. So he's wearing the sales and the operations hat. Um, so we are going to try to get him out of ops uh, as much as we can and get that mid-level manager. But that's where we've kind of shaken, shaken out to today. Yeah. <clears throat> What's also interesting, and I think other couples or partners that are in this space might relate to this is um, not everyone can learn at the same rate or has a desire to learn the same things within their business, right? And so, you know, going back to 2020, when we made the decision to start buying out of state, um, you know, just like on the personal level, we were working on having our second child. Kim was kind of like, I need to focus on that. Like you can kind of go ahead and learn this, but like, what was it that was even driving that? Right. And, um, I was just unhappy at my job. COVID hit my job roles switched, um, kind of want to speed up the exit there. Um, and since then, you know, it's been like three years now, a little over three years. <laughs> um, I was like very strict on myself to at least like take one action a day towards achieving whatever my goal was that week or that day or that month or that year. And it's amazing now looking back, you know, there's about a thousand steps or a thousand actions that I've taken, but like Kim didn't have the time necessarily take a thousand steps and that's okay. Right. There was this sort of like, learn, recalibrate, learn, recalibrate, break it down, learn again. And I find that a lot of couples or partners struggle a lot with that. Right. They, um, whether one person wants to do something, the other one doesn't. Um, I always say like for any entrepreneur, like your job is to sell, whether you like it or not, you know, you're not, you don't have any customers, you're not selling anything, you're not making any money. And the first person or people that you have to sell are those that have a say in what you do or how you spend your time. And I think that um, it can, it can make or, or break a lot of couples. It really can. Um, so it's just, it's interesting and, and yeah, like it has, I'd say now, even though we're managing a lot more than just our one or even two properties, I feel like it is a lot easier because like Kim and I each have a four R doc, you can join the mastermind and learn what, what that is if you want. Right. But like we each have a four R doc, we know exactly what our strengths and weaknesses are and we're very different. So I'm very, very good at envisioning things and I'm even better at connecting people to each other or to outcomes or to path pathways for success. Kim is really, really good at keeping things organized and consistent and an even cadence and making sure everything is working really well. And so I've had to learn a lot. You know, I know what she has the lead on, right? Like she's organized our Monday meetings. I organize the sales pipeline. You know what I mean? But we still step in for each other and and let the other person direct us on, on how to do each side of this coin so we can still have the safety net of Kim's W-2 for the time being, but also have a really, in my opinion, a, a really, really strong and healthy business, right? One that our owners are psyched to be a part of. So it's um it's been really neat in a lot of ways i think it's easier now than it was when we just had one short term rental um but it's taken 5 years of trial and error and then finally the ultimate you know i call it the the college education in this industry of of being part of the mastermind yeah dude what's that i was just going to say like without you even saying it, like just I want to talk about your journey over the last whatever it's been nine months and not not even to talk like, yes, it's obviously a plug for the mastermind, but you guys have just taken the information and executed on everything that we've taught you. And it's just like, whoosh, like, it's like proud papa moment. Like I get so jacked, like watching you guys because it's like 
the information is the same, but the speed at which you guys implemented it is what makes the big difference. And people ask me all the time, like, how, how quickly do I get my first deal? On average, it's 41 days in the mastermind, according to the numbers. However, the folks that do it a lot faster and then accelerate that growth do exactly what you guys did. So I'd love to like break down the last like nine months. So even if somebody's not in the group, what has that transition looked like for you guys? Because you, you, you gained some momentum and then you reevaluated the business, did a bunch of stuff and then move forward. So I don't want to tell the story, but I'd love for you guys to kind of break down what the last, whatever nine months has looked like and where you guys are at now. Yeah. I think that the tremendous growth in that nine months, um, I think that the cornerstone of that is that we are STR owners ourselves. So we've had months where we don't cover expenses and it sucks. So I think that we can relate to these owners so well because of that. So if they've been at a manager that's been mismanaging it, we had a house that's bigger, more beautiful than our house. And we did the same on revenue. So we run our smaller house, but mighty house better. And they were frustrated with their old, their old property manager. So I think that is one of the key pieces that's helped us get that credibility with our owners. So I think I'd say this really, we stumbled on this or Dave stumbled on this solo first, and then we joined forces on this, but uh, it was a friend of Dave's from, from growing up, got a short-term rental and wanted help managing it and said, hey, can you help co-host it? And that's how we got our first co-hosting deal. Then Dave had um, uh, some of his clients from being an agent. So he's a registered real estate agent. They wanted to buy houses in Massachusetts, but not for primary. They wanted a Cape Cod house like ours. So that was our second deal. And so it was these really friends and family that let us trial and, and learn from them um, because we already had some credibility with four years managing our own properties. And then also just understanding the the ups and downs of being an, a short term rental owner, and then it really uh, really started to pick up at the end of last year. I'll let you. Yeah. So what I was gonna say though is, that's what people see on the outside, mm -hmm. right? What was really happening though is, you know, we we went to, you know, we learned about this uh, this type of model, right, within short term rentals. And we started taking on co-hosting clients last summer and we were having a lot of challenges. We were having a lot of challenges uh, understanding how to set expectations with owners, how to be good managers for those owners because of that. We had no great systems other than Kim and I for managing guests. And it was just, it was really hard. It was really, really hard. And you know, we got to a point at some point over the winter where we had to have a really big recalibration and we had to have some deep thinking on if this was really it, like if this was really what we were going to do. And uh, it was Kim who had sort of been poking around, looking at masterminds to join. I was fairly occupied trying to understand co-hosting and we were pretty much like, okay, if we're going to lean into this business, we need to learn what the heck we're doing and we need support and we need to understand how to build this the right way. And so it was Kim who was like, we're joining that mastermind, STR Secrets Mastermind, and, and we're going to learn. Otherwise, Dave, you can go back into healthcare. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. And, but it was, it was hard. Like, I will tell you, there were tears. There were battle scars. It was some of the hardest times I think of my life professionally. And we hadn't even gotten going. Like we weren't an off the tarmac. Right. And so we joined, we got educated quite quickly and we worked with our coach and other people in the mastermind, really just our, our coach and you guys actually to help sort of understand where we were and how we could improve from there. And a couple really neat things have happened within that beginning. And then we'll get to more like the growth and sort of where we're at. But, you know, um, a year ago today, you know, I'm sitting in Nashville at the, in the back of the conference room watching and just trying to absorb. And in my mind, it was co-host as many houses as possible. I wasn't thinking quite about how I wanted those numbers to look. 
then uh, Mike, you and Bill introduced the Miami trip a few months later, and I'm texting Kim. Maybe it was my birthday and she had a soft moment. I don't know. But I said, I think this would be a really good opportunity. Thinking like, there's no way. Like, there's just no way. She's like, I, I was not at a job anymore. Like, no way. Immediately, she's like, yep, sign us up. Let's go. And I'm like, holy crap. Sort of like when we bought the house in Maine. Like, it actually worked. Um, we're there, right? And we're sitting down with Bill, Faith, and Julie George. And they're like, don't go for the small houses. If you're starting out and you already have one nice house that you own, go for the nice houses. Go for the big ones. Go for the ones that are going to actually bring in real revenue. And then like all the other reasons around why that's a good product to, to manage. You know what I mean? And so we took that to heart, right? And so then we had to kind of untangle from some lesser performing homes, which was really hard. And I tell people now, it's way easier to go get a badass house that you're co-hosting than it is to part ways with a bad home or owner. It's really hard to untangle that whole mess once you've gotten yourself into it. Um, but we we took that to heart. You know, our coach was always like, man, I wish I had as many nice houses as you guys. I was like, well, it's easy. We just say no to 90 percent of the stuff that comes over our desk. And at this point, you know what the portfolio looks like. And I'll go back to some of the stuff we've learned in the mastermind, but, um, you know, there's 16 homes, right? And we actually have four that sound, sounds like they're going to sign on with us soon. And all of them at the, uh, essentially they all average around a hundred K a year or more. Like that has been sort of like a keystone number for us. It seems to work well for the owners. It works well for the guests. It certainly works well for us. And, um, the number one question we get from owners is like, I want to get in on this quick because I, I don't want you to max out and not have time for me. That's where I lean on the mastermind. I say, look, as I've been learning how to make your houses more money, we're learning how to develop our team under us to be better than us so we can continue to grow at a thoughtful pace. And so while it might feel like a breakneck speed, you know, it's it's super calculated. It's super, super thoughtful, and it's taken just as much work to analyze and say no or yes to a house than it has to actually co-host it. Um, but it, it's something that's worked really well for us. So, and, and it's it's through the mastermind and the community and the pressure testing we can get of ideas through that that's allowed us to really follow through with that. And then it's Kim who actually makes sure that all this shit gets done. <laughs> 100%. So it has been hard at times. I'll say that. I I love what you said, right? Because I think it's a big mistake that people make at the beginning is you say yes to everything. Um, and another big mistake people make at the beginning is doing too many things. Kind of going back to what we talked about earlier is like we do too many things. And I, I honestly know that in my personal life comes from a place of scarcity. Meaning I don't believe that if I only do the things that I think I want to do, that I'm going to make it or I'm going to have enough money or kind of fill in the blank, right? It even knowing it, it's difficult sometimes, right? So what is that? So you mentioned like unless it makes a hundred K. So that's a pretty good kind of thing to weigh something against, right? What else do you guys have in there that helps you make the decision? Uh because again to me, to people listening, that makes a difference. Because the moment that you know what you want, you also don't know what you don't want. And what happens is when you kind of flip-flop between the two, without realizing you're losing momentum and you're also losing energy. Because then the worst thing that happens, at least to me again, is the fact that like every time I don't follow my own rules, I get in the place that I'm like, I knew this was going to happen. And then I start beating myself up. And I'm like, why do we do this? Like, we knew this wasn't the owner of the house, the neighborhood, kind of fill in the blank, right? So what does that look like? Like, how, like you have other things like that? Or is that 100K, the bare minimum, and that's, that's an easy in and out kind of choice? Let me take it first. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's a, a test on the house and there's a, a test on the owner who, you know, we are working for, right? like 
no one likes a shitty boss at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, some people shy away from owner communication. I don't for the most part, because we've selected houses and owners that I say like fill up our energy cup. Right. Cause to me, somebody falls in one of two camps, either they drain the life out of you or, or you're genuinely happy to be talking to them. And that is, is a, is a, and you only know that down in your gut, right. From talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's really what, you know, I'm using as a measuring stick. Um, the hard part is when you have a really amazing owner, but a home that can't hit that. And you just got to kind of stick to your guns and move forward. But I would say that the personality test with the owner and then the test on the home. And then there's other more tactical things depending on the market that everyone can make their own criteria for what works for them. But those have been the top two things, right? Um, that helps to build trust between the other owners. It helps to build trust with the home, right? Like we've taken some homes on where unfortunately there's a lot of bodies buried under those houses and it's just, it's a hard house, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but these being in the community like we've been in has really helped to accelerate this piece of the learning curve um, because you can learn from other people's experiences a little bit and really tie into that. Um, I don't know if you have anything. No, I was going to say it's a gut instinct. I think there's some hard criteria, like you said, the $100,000 threshold for revenue potential. There's the property itself, it, marketability of it, the logistics of it, and then the owner. I think that that's a big piece. If their goals are not aligned with trying to maximize revenue for them, then they want to use the house for a ton of personal time in the peak season and things of that nature. Then we realize it's we're probably not the right fit for you if you're going to take this a little bit more casually because we really want to push you to the to the top performing percentile. So those, are, but it, it, the last thing that I I trust my gut for a lot of things and. When we saw that first house for over four years ago, and we got in the car on a snowy fr February Saturday morning, Dave said, what do you think? I said, we've got to go for it. I just knew in my gut we had to buy this house, and it was going to be our forte in two short-term rentals, and we never looked back from there. And I think times I get out of touch with it, then I, that's when I seem to deviate or make a mistake. So I really try to go back to that and being very centered and thinking through, how do, mm -hmm. you know, how do I feel about this if I just put away all the mental energy and over calculating and what is my what is my gut telling me and my intuition telling me in this yeah and i love you said that kid because i would actually love to kind of dig into a little bit of that because i think we all have massive intuition i think intuition over time gets kind of jaded especially if you're more on the like uh, people pleasing side of life right like you have the intuition and then just from how you grew up or like how life has been to you you're like I can't, like, I can't, or oh, it's difficult. You don't want to have the hard conversations. Uh, but there is the element of what you said just now that, like, sometimes, like, sometimes I come out of center and I'm kind of rephrasing, right? I come out of center and I realize that, like, my intuition is not on point as much, right? Or I'm not listening to it. How do you guys fix that? Because I think there's a lot of people that are probably in that, in that place that are like, I can feel it. Because I go off of this a lot, and I know it's not science, but it's truth, right? Like, that's why people, like, that's why the sayings are there. Like, if the sayings weren't there, like, I got a gut feeling, it wouldn't have, like, you know, people wouldn't speak like that, right? So to me, there is a real brain in our, in, in our belly that helps you make choices and kind of vies with the rest of your body. Yeah. So when you're not able to listen to it, why is that? And two, when you realize that you're not listening to it, how do we go back to the magic of like trusting our intuition? I think the answer for me is in one and the same. The first thing I do is quiet the voices. I think that we have so much content thrown at us. Even myself, I listen to podcasts and audio books and I have long commutes into the into my office a couple of days a week. And I find that sometimes I need to actually have a, a detox from all of that and quiet things down and and uh, slow down to think about what do I need to do? What am I feeling? What are the challenges we're dealing with? 
And I write a lot. I have a notebook always on me at all times. And before I go to bed, I write in it. And it could be stressors. It could be my things I want to tackle tomorrow. But I think that's what helps me keep me recentered. I think it's been a while since I've felt off center. And I think we had some big challenges back in February with our co-hosting business. You were still small and, and mighty, but we had had some challenges with um, with a particular you know, property or two. And we had to figure out how we were, how we could be balanced and handle that appropriately and be able to manage it um, the you know mentally and emotionally what the challenges we're dealing with with that those particular acute situations and then more macro how can we handle this better in the future how can we weed out these energy drainers uh, whether it's a property that's very challenging and I think that that's helped steer us well for the last several months the beginning of this year felt like a blur and when we joined the mastermind it was only I think we had only three other properties besides our own and I think that we found those through referrals and just organically and then um, trying to add value into the into our communities helped get way more properties sent to us than we expected. And I think that's where we've had to constantly be in communication with each other. But I think that that separate time and being able to reflect and, and quiet all the voices and the content being thrown at us is is where I find that I can find myself recentered. And I also try to take care of myself with nutrition and working out again. I've been falling out of those things. And I think when I bring those back into motion, it really helps me. It makes for less time for other things, but it makes it me try to be more productive and have more quality time when I am working on our, our business or doing family time with our kids. I know we're we're getting close here on on time, but I wanted to just kick it over to Dave for one second for just some action tips. And I know we'll ask the last question after, but I'd love for you to share just because you, you've been on a tear, especially the last few months, like with lead generation, if you could give two or three different places that you've found good success for lead gen to make this pretty actionable for the listeners, what have some of the, your sources been on that front? Yeah, there's really two and both of them are free, which is the best part. The first has been adding value into different Facebook groups. And by that, like, yeah, everyone's got a cell phone, right? I, a lot of times will try and, uh, record myself giving, you know, advice on the TVs we use of the hot tubs or the generators or the bunk beds, like whatever's in your house already, talk about it and share that with your community. I mean, that is probably the number one way to start getting some leads and just being consistent with it. If you took 10 videos, post one, one video a week in every Facebook group you're in, in those areas. And this is for somebody that would want to be co-hosting, obviously, but then you have 10 weeks of content and people start to remember you. Uh, the second is, and they kind of bounce off of each other, but you know, we have really, really been successful by adding value to other realtors. And so what's happened is when I believe in my market and I can sell people that this is the best market, like I can sell them on the fact that I think this is the best market in our state or our area for co-hosting. And here's why. Eventually people come to me and start asking for, well, who's a realtor that I could work with in there. So I spent a lot of time creating partnerships and I have very specific partnerships in different markets. And you know, up in that Newry Bethel area, I think at this point that realtor so far this year has closed around six or $7 million worth of deals just from the leads I've sent him. And what's happened in return, as long as the house fits our criteria and the owner's really awesome, he sends us those leads back. And it's it's been a really awesome relationship because we don't owe each other anything. We have to close our own business. There's no referral fee, nothing like that. But you know, bringing value, right? So partnerships with realtors, leveraging Facebook groups and adding value in both of those consistently over 30 to 60 days should start to help you at least get noticed and get some traction. And I'd say to add to that, the realtors offered referral fees and you've said, <laughs> no, let's, let's just continue to have this awesome exchange here and, and just yeah. believing in karma and good and just giving, mm -hmm. giving, giving value, it'll come back around. So just want to clarify that part. Yeah. yeah. And the rules of reciprocity, right? Like the fact that you're giving them something extra is going to automatically make them want to give you more. Whereas right. if you just take the commission, there might be a one-off commission, but the fact yeah. that you don't want it and you keep referring things to them, they're like, well, I need to do something for Dave. Like, I don't know how to say thank you, but I'm going to need to do something for Dave. Um, 
Love it. When you say, do you do those videos? Because I want people to also understand, and this is a huge hack that we use, is he doesn't go there every week for 10 weeks. He probably goes there one time and films five, six, 10 videos at once, and then you post them over time. And for right. you to really understand, like, as you're listening to this, it's create SOPs also around the things that, like, you're trying to do and just find a way to do them either quicker or in a more efficient way. Because, again, it might be a pain for you to set up a 10 video. It might take you three or four hours, but it's going to take you a lot longer to go there every other week or every two weeks to do videos, right? So, like, kind of, like, own the fact that, like, what you're trying to do and own the fact that, like, there is a time that goes into it that feels like a lot, but when you look at it from the top, you'll realize how right. less time you're going to spend doing it just because you decided to spend a little bit longer to do it at the beginning. The other thing I'd say real quick, and I know we're coming to the end here, is, you know, bigger pockets will always say, like, anyone that gives you value, ask how you can help them in return. It's kind of a it's kind of a BS statement. Just start giving, right? Like, just if someone asks me how they can help me, I'm like, I don't know, do my social media every single day for a year. That would be helpful. You know, that's like that's not a reasonable ask of somebody, though. So it's like just start offering those things unannounced and you'll people notice that stuff 100 percent, 100 percent. well before we get in the last question i want to thank you guys for coming on here and uh sharing your story and your journey and uh super pumped to see where you guys go with this um where can the listeners learn more about you guys and find out all the info about everything that you guys got going on yeah so we have a, a website it's uh the five star cohost.com, but it's five, the number five, str cohost.com. Uh, our uh, Instagram handle is the same, five str cohost.com, or it might be five star cohost.com. You'll find it either way. And then uh, there's also menapace underscore real estate that's on Instagram too. So that's probably the best way, either of those. Love it. Love it. Well, as you know, the last question that we ask all of our guests is, what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals? Can we ha each have our own answer? Sure. We'll share the, <laughs> we'll share the love. Obviously. Okay, why don't you go Trying first? Trying to subliminally send it to you? Just kidding. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it's reach up and out. I think that we've learned and accelerated so much by just meeting more people. And instead, when we run into challenges, instead of, you know, kind of suffering silently and keeping it to ourselves, being vulnerable and honest and reaching out to other people we've met through a variety of ways. I think that's been my biggest uh, learning this, these last, uh, this last year, especially these last few months when things have been really accelerating in our business. And then my, my secret is one that not many people have access to. So sorry about that. But my secret is sitting right next to me, Kim. So the reason I say that is if you follow our timeline, our journey, it was Kim's idea to buy the house in Cape Cod. It was Kim who said, if we find the right deal, we'll figure out the money piece. And then did the research to figure out how we could buy more houses out of state. It was not Kim's idea for Maine, but that's okay. It was her idea that we stick with it even through some of the biggest challenges we've had. And it was her idea that we joined the mastermind. And if you think about all the right decisions we've made, those are all of them right there. You know, the rest is just putting in the work. So I'm thankful for Kim, my, uh, my homie right here. And that's my secret. So we all got, we all got to find a Kim. So yeah. Yeah. Find find a Kim. Find yeah. <laughs> that, like the bad news is that you can have this Kim, but the good news <laughs> is that, in a way, shape, or form, you may be able to find a Kim in your life that works like that. And and I love you guys overall, and I love your appreciation for each other, and I love that like that homey feeling, right? Like the the fact that like you guys are in it together. And at the end of the day, like your spouse, sometimes they put kind of friction, and they don't mean it from a bad place necessarily. Sometimes I hope not, at least. Uh, and just kind of like figuring out how to make this work is going to yield the most 
life-changing things because right. anything else, you know what I mean? Like even if you do a partnership with somebody else that is not your spouse, the benefits that you're going to yield from it are going to be always less, at least in my mind, to what you can create when you create a beautiful business that sustains a beautiful life within your family. Um, so I'm super excited for you guys, super proud. I'm super Thank grateful you. that you guys are in our, in our circle. Thanks for having us. Honestly, yeah, it's been life changing for us. So it's, it's been fantastic. Awesome. Listen. Well, this was a lot of fun uh, for the listeners out there. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, make sure you follow these guys on Instagram and Facebook. They're like the epitome of exactly what you want to do and just continue to take action and always lead with value. Like if I was going to categorize these, they're just genuinely good people and they always, always lead with value and the results will always follow that. So just keep that in mind. Have an amazing week. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.